Welcome to Plant Ecology. This is the first of the recorded lectures for this year. General Plant Ecology is the number for undergrads to take. Plant Ecology for graduate students. Historically, this started out as a graduate class that grew to become an undergraduate elective. This course assumes some background in ecology and will meet twice a week for the lecture part of the class. Before you come to class each time, I'd like you to do the reading in the syllabus, watch the recorded lectures, and look at the little videos or whatever else I have on the website for that day. Then when you come to class, we'll work on things together that will reinforce your learning, let you apply what you've learned about that topic. I hope that you'll do these things and I'm going to put into place little quizzes at the beginning of class using clickers if possible to check on your preparation. And if you do this preparation you'll find you get the maximum benefit out of our time together. In this class you'll have six exams, some of them of sort of unusual format, but the final exam will be a traditional final exam. Each of the exams is worth 10% of your grade and will count the, six, the five best of the six. During the term you'll work on four group projects where you work with others to look into a topic, prepare a presentation and a paper. So you'll do four of those and will count the grades on the three best ones for 30 percent of your grade and then you'll be graded for in-class activities 10 percent and take home and online activities 10 percent. These will be the preparation quizzes in large part. In the class you can also get some extra credit doing various things. I'll explain that on the website and I'll post opportunities on the website as well. So to succeed in this plant ecology class, I want you to come to class. You should do all the required reading and other activities requested before you come to class that day. And in any topic where you find yourself especially interested, do some extra reading, look into stuff. Please ask me questions and I can try my best to answer or guide you and us to places we can look for answers. And discuss the material of the class with your fellow students and other professors. So even though ecology at many universities is one of the more recent areas of hiring faculty, it's really one of the oldest sciences because our primitive ancestors had to learn their way around their environment, learn what to eat and how to avoid getting eaten. Today we have many more sophisticated approaches, but basically we still want to know how to produce food for ourselves and how to predict what is going to happen in our world. We're at the end of summer in much of the United States. It still feels pretty summery here in Miami. But this year has seen some extremes in temperature and in 2011 and 12 they were said to be the hottest, driest summers in our country since the 1930s. And in the 1930s during the Dust Bowl era there were serious droughts in 1988, maybe before some of you were born, but we can all, many alive today can remember these drought times. And what happens during those times is crops fail. So not only farmers suffer, but the people who depend on those crops for food suffer. And there are lots of wildfires in very dry conditions and high temperatures that lead to their spreading. And of course, heat related human illness and death, not to mention other animals. How can plants adapt 
to such extremes? And how can we grow food to feed the world's population in the face of things like this? These are some of the questions plant ecologists can hope to answer. So why are plants so important? Probably the first reason is they are the primary producers that fix carbon, makes new biomass that's the nutrition for all living organisms, plant and animal. They're also really important because they structure all of the habitats. They are the framework in which everything else lives. In ecology, we have levels of organization, just like you learned in general bio, below the organismal individual level. Here, if we start with an individual of any species, a population is a group of those individuals that live in a certain place together. A community is populations of different species living in the same place, ants and butterflies and plants all of a certain place. And an ecosystem is the community plus the abiotic factors that are present, water, soil, and other things. An ecology can be organized into different levels of study. Ought ecology, which is ecology of the individual, physiological ecology, biophysics, how individuals cope with stresses, etc. Deem ecology, which is population ecology, including demography, evolutionary ecology, and um, prediction of persistence of rare species, etc. And lastly, syn ecology, like synthesis, is the ecology of the community, which involves things at the level of vegetation, ecosystems included here, and even ecosystems and communities of the past in paleoecology. This plant is Anemia adiantifolia, the pineland fern. And we might ask a question, how does the frequency of fire in pine rocklands affect the abundance of the pineland fern? You may know this, but the foliage, photosynthetic leaves you can see here are just green, and the sporophylls, or spore-bearing leaves, here are some green ones, are separate fronds, or separate parts of the fronds. Here are the mature spores, the brown. This is a question that we might ask in ought ecology. At the population level, or species interaction level, that kind of bridges population and community studies. We could ask for this beautiful butterfly pea, will flowers with petals sucked by flies get pollinated by bees? And you can see the marks of damage on the petals. Oops, I'm trying to get my little marker here, but it's not working very well there where the petals are discolored. Or a syn ecological question could be, how much carbon is there in each of these forest layers? We could compare the soil and the understory plants to the canopy plants and maybe even look at epiphytes. Chemical ecology spans one or more of these areas, and we might look at a flowering plant and ask what factors affect floral fragrance. These could be factors of the environment or time of day. It also could involve looking at the chemicals involved. So in plant ecology, we'll use the scientific method, which involves first observing phenomena, then asking questions or maybe speculating about what causes something making hypotheses that can be tested and falsified or supported, and to do that, often designing and conducting experiments. So getting back to that butterfly pea system, blister beetles eat the butterfly pea petals, 
and little flies, like the guy here, suck the petals, discoloring them. Do damaged flowers get pollinated? Do bees visit damaged flowers? These are first the observations we would make and then some questions we might ask. From our textbook, this diagram shows how this scientific method works. From observations or even data you collect, you speculate and then apply reasoning to think about how this, what might be happening and compared to current theories, formulate hypotheses, and design experiments to test the valid validity of your predicted results. So it might be <clears throat> your hypothesis is supported, and then the way science works, other people might test in the same way. Further experiments go, and um, hypotheses that are upheld time after time are called theories. So that's where ecological theory comes from. If, however, the results don't support the hypothesis, this is called falsify. or falsifiability, that's a good hypothesis, one that can be proven wrong, then you reevaluate, go back to the drawing board, come up with some other ideas. So with that butterfly P question and hypothesis, questions, do bees visit those flowers, we might hypothesize, no, they don't. And so setting up systematic observation on flowers damaged versus flowers not damaged, we could see um, what the visitation rate of bees is to these different kinds of flowers. So here are two different sites, Long Pine Key and Pine Shore. In the, the first set of bars are the proportion of flowers damaged by blister beetles that are visited by bees. The second set of bars, the proportion of flowers with petals sucked by flies that are visited by bees. And then control. These are undamaged flowers. You can see their visitation rate to undamaged flowers is much higher. So <clears throat> the hypothesis that damaged flowers get less visits would be upheld. So a good hypothesis has to be testable or falsifiable. A model may be something we use to test the hypotheses or components of a theory. Ecologists often look for patterns which are relationships between pieces of the natural world and by understanding patterns, we can then predict what might happen in an, another similar situation. Processes are things that cause those patterns. And last of all, I want to distinguish that word theory. It has a popular meeting, meaning, which might mean a speculation, but in science, it means a theory, a hypothesis that has been repeatedly tested and found to be strong, robust. This table from our book talks about the components of a theory and words used by scientists to describe these things. Every theory has assumptions which are conditions or structures needed to build that theory, and sometimes they're made to simplify things, to better uh, focus on the item in question. And here's hypothesis. Testable statements derived from or representing various components of the theory. 
confirmed generalizations are what we can condense from a body of facts that have been tested, hypotheses that have been tested are called facts, <clears throat> and models, very important in ecology, are simply ideas or conceptual constructs that represent the natural world, usually in a simplified way. So the way we test hypotheses is to, very often to do experiments, and sometimes an experiment is done just by systematically collecting data of things under different conditions. Sometimes an event happens that creates a natural experiment, for example, a fire burning through one part of an ecosystem and not another, and then you can compare what happens. Or you may have planned the fires in a certain design, and then that would be a manipulative experiment, usually done with a control. And one example of this is the long-term study that's been done at the Kanza Prairie, our book has a map and discussion of this, and there are areas <clears throat> that are burned at different times. Some are grazed by one kind of herbivore, bison or buffalo, other areas grazed by cattle, and other areas under agriculture, and some areas, the light green color here, ungrazed. <clears throat> the different numbers of years between burns are shown with the number preceding each letter and the different times of burn winter, spring, summer, and fall also. In a study of this magnitude they're trying to get at variation or heterogeneity in both space and time by conducting multiple samples over the landscape looking at interactions between the plants, the vegetation, and animals in different places, and repeatedly sampling over time gives a, an indication of how things change over time. Fire in different seasons, manipulating in different seasons. And I wanted to uh, make the point that here in the Everglades, where we have fire-dependent pine rockland habitats, they've done similar experiments for many years and monitored vegetation change for one purpose to determine the, the proper fire return interval and the right season of burning. And different biologists can study these experiments at different levels using different scales for different phenomena. I like this figure from our book that shows how ecologists can study things across a wide range of scales in both space and in time. And this xy axis, time on the x-axis, and space on the y-axis, shows that some things are studied in a very short amount of time, like photosynthesis, carbon dioxide transport in leaves, and others at the other extreme, like climate change over eons and many different locations. So D, let's look at D, an annual plant, and you can see that this is one year. Annual plants are those that go from seed to reproductive individual, reproductive adult, and then die within a year. Perennial plants last longer. But this is their growing phase, I guess it says. A perennial plant, though, may persist for many years, maybe even a hundred or more years. Populations are studied usually from one to a hundred years. Communities, maybe even longer, with photos over decades, 
over a couple of hundred years. And species may move and change where they occupy in space and time over longer periods of time. So in this class, we're going to start with the close-up stuff. We'll start off by looking how individuals interact with their environment, especially microhabitat effects on the different physiological processes. As you can imagine, photosynthesis is kind of important in plants. Then we'll look at the evolution of characteristics of individuals and species. You have to look at this at, at a population level to understand it and move on to interactions of species, interactions within a population of the same species and between individuals of different species, and then on up to communities, landscapes, and global patterns. So even though we think of plant distributions often at the vegetation level and community or ecosystem level, it's interesting to me that close-up phenomena can really affect plant distributions. And if you look at why plants occur in a certain habitat or location on a dune, for example, or mountain, there are many ecophysiological things that affect whether they get established or not. But I think you can probably think of factors at many levels, and we'll discuss some of these things in class.